We've got the one-week countdown to this year's NFL draft. And the Eagles gave us a little bit of a preview yesterday. Very little bit of a preview yesterday <laughs> from Harry Roseman and Nick Sirianni. You got your Mega Mac guys, McDonald and McMullen, hanging with you. JM, you made your way over to the uh, Noble Care Complex after yesterday's show to learn what? Um, What did I learn? I learned a couple things. Uh you know, how he was nice enough to do off the record stuff, which I can't talk about. So we learned a lot from that standpoint. But as far as uh, in front of the camera on the record, yeah, it was a typical Howie Roseman. He's been doing this a long time. He understands how to how to do these things, you know. Always behind Jalen Hurts when the microphone appears. Did get a couple. I did get him to admit the tears of the draft. And and I and I was trying to say, you know, there's so much uncertainty at the top of the draft, and we and we usually have a consensus by this point, at least for the couple first couple picks, and it it could be all over the place, you know, depending on what Jacksonville decides with Aiden Hutchinson or Trayvon Walker, and if Detroit goes Malik Willis, the whole thing's going to blow up. But, um, you know, he 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 said there's not much uncertainty at the top of the draft from a player perspective. And he mentioned, he mentioned the term 20, which he probably didn't want to do. So that kind of gives me the, the tea leaves that the Eagles, that first tier of player, the Eagles got to 20. And then he mentioned probably from 21 to 50, there's a lot of disparaging thoughts about the players and things of that nature. So the Eagles sit at 15 and 18. They probably wanted to stay in that range because they think there's 20 good players in this draft. So you can figure out little things like that. Um, and I think he he kind of gave that away. Um, but, you know, as far as individual players, we talked yesterday, he wasn't going to go down that road. He never goes down, down that road, nor should he. Howard, our friend Howard Eskin, tried to pepper Nick Sirianni about, would you rather have an offensive player or a defensive player? Nick wasn't going to answer that. And that's just, you know, yeah, and you don't want to let other teams know what you're thinking. So, um, but I know what Nick is thinking. He wants an offensive player. If you're listening, Howard, obviously come on. Now, well, um, hold on, hold on. I, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to defend my guy Howard here. Because... Well, uh, Jonathan oh, no, Gannon no, no, might no, no, want no, a no, defensive no, no. player, Jody. He, he took a shot at All my right, boy, Howard. Right. Now, defend my boy, Howard. All right. He didn't ask him, who are you going to pick at 15 with a, your pick an offensive or defensive guy? What he asked was, do you feel you need more improvement on the offense or the defense? Well, if you want to equate that to the first pick in the draft that the Eagles have, that that's going to be tipping their hand, okay, but that's you drawing a conclusion. Howard didn't ask the question that way. And, oh, by the way, here's the reason why I think it's a nothing burger from Howard or from anybody else. They got two picks, 15 and 18. If they yeah. take an offensive player at 15 and a defensive player at 18 – Ooh, does that really tell you that they have so many concerns about the offense and uh, they're not really worried about the defense? If it goes vice versa, who cares? If they keep both picks and they take one at one and one at the other, ooh, two picks earlier, they took an offensive player. Two picks earlier, they took a defensive player. What's the difference? Well, you're right. You, you, he said, obviously, I should have explained it better. He said, offense, defense, what needs the most improvement? But you're asking an offensive coach, which was my only point. If you're asking Jonathan Gannon, he's probably going to say defense. You know? sure. You're asking Nick Sirianni, he's going to say offense. Now, he didn't say anything because he's smart enough to be uh, political, uh, and he's the head coach of the team, and he realizes, well, this isn't my decision anyway, so uh, let's trickle this down the road. But um, – yeah, I mean, he's an offensive guy. I mean, he's always thinking offense. And he kind of admitted that when uh, someone asked him about his role in the scouting process. And obviously, he's, he, he he admitted his expertise is on the offensive side of the football. But you can chime in on things that you know about from the offensive perspective. So, you know, when you're talking about pass coverage, defensive backs, linebackers now in the modern NFL – you know, he's, you know, he can chime in and say, well, we need this so we can cover this or vice versa and all that kind of stuff. But, and that's what you get. And that's what I said yesterday, more themes than anything else. And um, it's an interesting draft. And not only because the Eagles have two picks, but because there are no 
highly regarded quarterbacks. And typically there is. And typically, you know, if you asked me this back 10 months ago, Jody, I probably would have told you, and I probably did tell you, well, somebody will come up to the top of the board. Somebody always comes up to the top of the board because it's such a, a quarterback desperate league. And it looks like nobody's going to go up to the top of the board with a little, you know, you leave a little bit of a door open for Detroit Malik Willis. And that's pretty much it. If they took a Kenny Pickett that high, I would be surprised, but you know, you go back, what would the Blake Bortles draft? Nobody thought Blake Bortles was going, I think he went fourth overall. I think it was the third, might yeah. it was third or fourth. Um, nobody saw that coming. And, and by the way, it shouldn't have came, you know, hindsight being 2020, but you never know, but it doesn't look like one of those quarterbacks is going to go up very high in the draft. And that's rare. That is rare that one of them doesn't get pushed up that high. Two of them are going to get pushed up. They're just not going to get pushed up that high. I know. Right. The question is how high we won't know till the one week from tonight on Thursday night, when the first round of the NFL draft gets underway. Um, I got to give Howie Roseman credit in that uh, one of the earliest questions in the media gathering was about the trade with the saints how much of the thought process was to be able to get a first round pick next year in case you need to go back into the quarterback uh, factory ability to uh, pick and select and develop a quarterback. Uh, that's what most of us have speculated on. I believe you believe that. I know I believe that, that that was a big part of their making the trade. Howie Roseman wasn't copping to it. Yeah, no, they believe no. well, in- he, can't, he can't cop to it, but I always say, you know, the microphones appear and he's saying, yeah, we love Jalen Hurts. We love Jalen Hurts. And then he goes behind the curtain, behind the screen, and he picks up the phone. Hey, what's going on with Russell Wilson? Wait, where's Deshaun Watson? Where's this legal stuff? You know, let's bring in Matt Corral for a top 30 visit. Let's do all the due diligence on these quarterbacks. Um, these quarterbacks aren't that good. So let's spin one of these picks off to 2023 when the, when the draft is supposed to be better at, at quarterback and we got a long way to go. And I just said one way, you know, the other way, Jody, I'm going to give you an opportunity to say his name, DJ. We younger Lele. Thank you. <laughs> you know, who, who, Oh, by the way, was not good this past year. No, he was terrible. That's what I'm saying. You know, they had him coronated. I'm not, that's I did. Go Trevor I, right into DJ. That that Notre Dame game that he played Phil oh, for Trevor Lawrence. Phenomenal. I said they're going to be uh, in, uh, over the course of three years going to have the number one pick in the draft yeah. quarterback two out of the three. So it can go both ways. Spencer, Spencer Rattler the same way. But Sam Howell, by the way, when Javante Brown and 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 Michael Carter and Dynami Brown were with him in North Carolina, people were talking about it. Oh, he's going to be the first overall pick in the draft. Um, and then he loses all that player and you know, all those skill position players and, and things go the way they go. Spencer Rattler's in South Carolina now, I believe. He's not even an – he got benched at Oklahoma. Correct. Um, so you can talk about Bryce Str- uh, C.J. Stroud and Bryce Young and, and, and Phil Jerkovitz all you want 12 months out. Doesn't mean they're going to be there 12 months from now. Um, now – I, I think you can be pretty comfortable with Bryce is going to be uh, at the top. Um, everybody else, man, I could see it going in a negative Ooh. direction. So the I, problem here is. I actually think CJ Stroud's going to be at the top of the draft. So it's where making this picture, the, the pick. Oh, it's possible because he's bigger. 380 yeah. days in advance. We're, we're a little ahead of the curve here. Yeah, well, I, think- I know. My only point is I could see things because of where Bryce is, number one, um, and his coaching he gets and what Alabama is. Not that there's anything wrong with Ohio State, but nothing's Alabama uh, from a player development perspective uh, since Nick Saban got there. So I I think there's fewer um, fewer potholes, so to speak, in his road to 12 months being in the top five than, than CJ Stroud. Not that CJ's not going to be there. He's probably going to be there. I'm just saying, you never know. Cause we, I just gave you two examples with DJ and um, Spencer Rattler, really a third and Sam Howell. 
And then the opposite happens. You're a Jets guy. You know, nobody was talking about Zach Wilson. All of a sudden, he's one of those guys that shoots up the board, and, you know, he's where he is. Um, so it, it happens both ways. But, you know, my one concern with the Eagles, and I kind of mentioned it on yesterday's show, Jody, is they seem to be wor- waiting for this perfect spot that doesn't exist. You know, I, I'm not a fan of that because I don't – you, you you can go on unless you have that Sixers like mentality. Congratulations to the Sixers, uh, big win, big shot by Joel Embiid. Unless you have that thought process of you're willing to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and hope you know Joel Embiid shows up, and it's easier in the NBA than the NFL. Um, all right, I I don't think. I don't think Jeffrey Lurie's okay with that. I don't think Howie Roseman's okay with that, but they seem to be doing but they seem to be doing it. Well, we'll just wait. We'll just wait. Well, you already saw it. You saw it in practice. Russell Wilson, for whatever reason, doesn't want to come to the East Coast. So Sean Watson. For whatever reason, you know, if you don't believe he doesn't want to take Jalen Hurts' opportunity, like some fans, fine. But for whatever reason, he, he, he didn't want to come here. You know, there's no guarantee one of these quarterbacks is going to show up and then on the back end that you can actually get them because guess what? There's a bunch of other teams looking for quarterbacks at all times in this league. And despite them basically refusing to come out and say it and uh, almost denying it vehemently with the, again, over-the-top praise of Jalen Hurts, I think they've kind of acknowledged it with the deal that they made with the Saints. Yeah. If we're going to get a franchise quarterback, there's a real good chance it's going to have to be through the draft. That we explored the options of trading for top flight quarterbacks and they both gave us the Heisman Trophy pose and said, no, thank you, Philadelphia. So if you're going to go find that guy, you're going to have to do it in the draft. You're going to have to hit. The, the right year at the right place at the right time and that's why they expanded the possibilities by getting another pick uh, next year with the deal with the Saints I uh, another thing that I thought was interesting yesterday maybe it's because I, I hope that they were only again playing the game sounds to me like the Eagles are good at safety John uh, got, we got a lot of guys on this roster who play safety. You know, we've drafted a bunch over the last couple of years. Uh, uh, the safety is not necessarily, according to you guys, in some other quarters might be pointing <laughs> to safety and calling it an E, but here in this building, we're okay with safety. Really, Howie? I know you got to say what you got to say, but, the, he, and to his credit, he said it with a straight face yesterday, that they're kind of good and rattled off a couple of guys on the roster who, are going to be stepping into play for the Eagles this year because not as big a position of need as uh, we may think it is. What, what do you think about his uh, depicting the Eagles at safety as of right now? Uh, the microphones are there, Jody. The microphones are there when they show up. It's interesting, you know. Look, they tried to sign Marcus Williams. You know, they went. He went. He went too high, but it's interesting. They were willing to go up. We talk about, all right, the Eagles don't value safeties. They remember taking a safety in the in the first round of the draft. Um, it's interesting, you know, um, how we did mention that Jim Schwartz seemed to value safeties a lot. So they did go out in free agency and get Malcolm Jenkins and Rodney McLeod, which is, you know, two pretty good contracts when they got here originally. Um, and they were willing to go over $10 million for Marcus Williams. Um, so again, actions speak louder than words. They were going to get a safety. So that tells me they know they need a safety. Um, there were basically four players they targeted in the, in, in free agency. And one they got, which was Hassan Reddick. The other was Christian Kirk. And they said Godspeed when he got the contract that he got. And the other was Marcus Williams, who was a little bit, I mean, Baltimore went to where they weren't willing to go, but they were willing to go again into over double digits. Um, and then once 
uh, Christian Kirk, they shifted quickly shifted to Allen Robinson. And Allen's a little bit different, and he just went to Los Angeles to play with the Super Bowl champions and all that kind of stuff. I don't, I don't think that was as much money related as just he wanted to play there. Um, so those were the four players they really, really targeted, um, and one of them's a safety. <laughs> so what does that tell you? Um, yeah, they need a safety. They know they need a safety, but it's interesting. We've talked about the draft stuff and. They seem willing, and I think it was Ben Solek who brought that up. Um, you know, the league the league doesn't devalue safeties. It seems to devalue rookie safeties, which is opposite of usual positions because they pay better in safeties. Right. Um, and the Eagles seem to be in that same category. And it was interesting when when Howie was talking about the the boon at the wide receiver position. He went into, we don't want to be like everybody else. Well, they seem to be like everybody else when it comes to safety. We'll play, we'll pay a veteran. You go back to Malcolm, you go back to Rodney, you try to get Marcus Williams. We'll pay a veteran, but we don't want to go in the deep run. If Kyle Hamilton is there, and I don't think he's going to be there, they better take Kyle Hamilton. They they've acknowledged they need a safety. But I don't, I don't. I don't get feeling that's the way they're leaning, Jody. And no, hopefully he's not going to be there because that'll drive me crazy. You, you and I both. Um, he, it was an interesting take that he had about uh, the wide receivers and the expanding markets, and you have to be able to react, but you have to react correctly. Uh, just because someone else does doesn't mean you have to. What I read into that was the Eagles want to be ahead of the curve. They don't want to be a follower. They want to be ahead of the curve. I don't even know what position you would uh, well, I, to identify. I think, I think he was talking in general. Um, they like, to, in fact, they're obsessed. Les can talk about this. Les Bone, we got to get to break, but um, Les uh, can talk about this because he's been around this team for a long time, but they're kind of obsessed with being ahead of the curve, whether it's analytics, whether it's, you know, fourth down aggression in 2017, all that kind of stuff. They pride themselves. They love when people say they're ahead of the curve. Um, I don't think it was just about setting the curve on contracts. They're very budget conscious. In fact, he says what he's saying there is he wants to be ahead of the curve and not doing stupid moves. That's how I took it is, is basically uh, what I okay. think he was trying uh, to get across. Pointing the finger at other teams is stupid. That would be real good. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jody McDonald, John McBone. We are the Mac and Mac guys here on Birds 365. As John teased you. Coming up next, we got one of our faves. Doing it these days for NJ.com. Jumping back into the deep end of the pool. I'm pretty sure I heard him ask a question yesterday on Zoom. Les Bowen's going to join us here on Birds 365. At Stateside Vodka, every new customer gets the world's best rocks glass. Free. What's that? Uh, a rocks glass? You're telling me that bottle is cut in half? You could say that. Holy shit. And you're telling me I can get one of these glasses for free? That's right. One free rocks glass per customer with each first-time purchase of Stateside Vodka. So good, it just disappears. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today, and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian. In my heart, I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222.
field of life, First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the memories. Go for the view. It goes on forever. Go for the bubbles in your bathtub and in your drink. Go to bed whenever you want. Or don't. Go for him. Go for her. Go for the wind. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Your Maga Mac guys here on Birds 365, McMullen and McDonald. And adjusting his camera, joining us is none other than Les Bowen from NJ.com. Les, you look relaxed. Are you ready to cover the Eagles for the 2022 season? Oh, absolutely. Any minute now, yes. Yeah, and Howie was surprised to see Les. Uh, he wrote him a thank you note and all that good stuff when Les... Uh, no, they never retired. I don't know why they're blaming you, Les. Well, I kind of did retire. I mean, I'm not working every day on the beat like I was. But well, yeah, yeah. Howie wants his uh, Howie wants his football back. Wants his football back. There. Yeah. yeah, wants his uh, game ball back. I told him Brady did it, so you know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good line, Les. Uh, so we had a little bit of fun, Les, working these days, as you mentioned for NJ.com. Uh, wrote a piece about Brandon Brown and Ian Cunningham. So I want to talk to you about that. But in, before we get there, you were hanging on during the break in the green room. I don't know if you heard uh, Jody and I, but uh, when, when Howie was talking about the wide receiver spike in salaries and, and kind of saying, you know, we want to, you know, we don't want to follow the crowd. We want to, we want to be the leaders. How did you take that as somebody who's been around this organization uh, for as long as you have. Yeah, I kind of took it the way you did, John. He's if you the Eagles over the years, for better or worse, and sometimes it's worse, they really do uh, keep a finger in the air as far as trends and uh, you know inefficiencies they can exploit and things like that. You had Chip Kelly and sports science, which in some ways was they, they've you know they kept some of that stuff that yeah. Chip did even though some of it was, you know, they're no longer measuring the femurs of uh, <laughs> prospects at the senior bowl and stuff are making guys sleep in masks, you know, uh, but some of it was very useful. You know, you, they still have the individualized smoothies and, you know, they still have a very, you know, chip brought in a bunch of people that, uh, you know, attend to, uh, it makes a lot of sense to, to have a lot of people involved in the medical side of keeping guys healthy and, and uh, you know, productive and, and stuff like that. So, yeah, I didn't uh, – that wasn't one of my main takeaways from yesterday, really, frankly. I think this whole thing with the salaries is very interesting with the wide receivers because it comes at a time – you're looking at a really good wide receiver draft. So – the question for a lot of these teams is like, let's say Debo Samuel is actually available, you know, for trade. He wants to be traded. If you can draft one of the top two or three receivers in this draft and have him at an entry level contract for four years, would you rather have that at 15 or would you rather have Debo Samuel? You know, and that might be, or at 10, if you're the jets, you know, um, that's an interesting question to me. You know, it's uh, it, the wide receiver thing has busted wide open. The Christian Kirk uh, contract, I think uh, it was clear that it just took the rest of the NFL. Uh, it was one of those moments where people just sort of, you know, look at their phone like, what? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah the wide receiver position is getting a lot of notice, but it's also, uh, it kind of highlights the disparity, you know, this deal that the players signed off on in 2011 with the entry level, uh, yeah. four years yeah. really makes it much more, 
uh, beneficial to have guys at that really good players in that scale than it does signing guys for market level deals, uh, at least until the cap goes way up next year, which is supposed to do. All right. So since we went to wide receivers, let me follow up there. Um, Devonte Adams got the big payday he got when he mm-hmm. got traded. Tyreek Hill got the big payday that he got when he got traded. Christian Kirk got the incomprehensible payday that he got <laughs> via free agency. And all of the guys did it. Well, we know Christian Kirk did it for the money. The other two guys did it because they they forced a trade. When is Devonta Smith going to say, I no longer want to be a Philadelphia Eagle because we don't throw the football. We run the football here in Philadelphia. It seems uh, like a bunch of uh, potential moves that the Eagles made this year were thwarted because, well, why would a wide receiver really want to come here? Because uh, we, we've set our identity the second half of last year as a running team so we don't profile as someone who will allow a player to put up numbers. When it's Devonta go, hey, I want to get the hell out of Dodge before uh, I become a middle-of-the-road receiver and put up mediocre numbers and can't command a Devonta Smith, Tyreek Hill type payday. That's a good question. I, I don't know. I don't think we're on that. I don't think that we're there yet, but uh, it all depends on Jalen Hurts. I think their plan is for Jalen Hurts to be a lot better in the passing game this year, and if he isn't, then they'll go elsewhere uh, in 2023 uh, for a rookie, you know, that they draft or try to find a quarterback somehow. Um, I don't think on the long run, they're going to be a run based team. I don't see that as a way that you win the Super Bowl in this era. Um, but right now, yeah, I'm sure there's a little, uh, you see all these lists of great receivers and so forth and great young receivers. And sometimes you don't see Devonte Smith on there and it isn't because he isn't as good as those players. It's because he didn't really have the numbers as a rookie. And I'm sure there's a tiny part of his brain that, you know, processes that. But right now, I don't think that's a big concern coming off his rookie season. Uh, you know, I, I think he likes Jalen hurts uh, they know each other very, very well. They were college teammates briefly. Um, I think he's on board with trying to make Jalen Hurts a better passer and, you know, get those numbers up a little bit. All right, Les, so let's mesh those two together, quarterback Jalen Hurts, the receiving issues this team has had for a number of years that date mm-hmm. back pre-Nick Sirianni, obviously. Um They've gone, when you talk about the cost-effective route, the 2011 CBA, they've gone wide receiver at the top of the draft uh, with J.J. and then Jalen Rager, and finally they got it right with Devontae Smith. Now they might have to take another swing at the top of the draft uh, for the reasons you talked about um, among them. Um, And then you have the quarterback. So I look at – I always look at teams and you know, this less, you know, they say one thing in front of the microphone, they do another thing behind the microphone. To me, the Eagles look, they went after Christian Kirk until the number got too hot. Then they shifted to Allen Robinson and he wanted to go to play for the Super Bowl champions, which is understandable. They tried to trade for Calvin Ridley. We know what happened there. They wanted to get in with Robert Woods. He wanted to go to Nashville for whatever reason. So you have all these veteran receivers. They wanted to get, they wanted to get one of them. So that tells me that was plan a veteran receiver. And now they got to shift to plan B another young receiver where Devontae Smith and even Quez Watkins have to mentor them instead of being mentored. Yes. Do you think that's helpful to Jalen Hurts and his development? Yeah, that's that's a real concern, John. You know, that that clearly was their plan. And that would have made so much sense to have a veteran receiver in that group, uh, a really good veteran receiver who could kind of lead the group. Uh, that was the plan going into the offseason. It seemed like a pretty viable plan. But then, uh, you know, there's the guys you mentioned, there's guys like Chris Godwin signing with their original teams, you know, uh, it just didn't, uh, the market didn't turn out to be what they'd anticipated. And 
Uh, it is not a good situation to be looking at the draft, uh, at looking at spending a first round pick on a wide receiver. Uh, you look at their defense and the best players on that defense, which isn't a real good defense, are over 30. Uh, they are in a position where they've, they've devoted so many resources to wide receiver in particular. I think it's, I, I wrote a thing about this uh, recently. Let's see if I, my memory is decent, but I think since 2015, five first or second round picks uh, have gone to the wide receiver position, yeah. which is extraordinary. I mean, you can even, it, obviously the first guy in that list would be Nelson Aguilar, who wasn't a horrendous bust, but if Nelson Aguilar were, you know, a top all pro receiver on his second contract now, you know, they never would have done a lot of the other things they had yeah. to do. Sort of a you know, butterfly effect. You keep going down the same route. Yes. You can't and, just keep doing this year after year after year without it really hurting the rest of your team. Uh, this is what happened with, you know, Matt Millen and the Detroit Lions where he kept drafting wide receivers. Um, yeah, it's, it's not a great position to be in, even though this is a good wide receiver draft. And if they do have to take one at 15 or 18, they can certainly find one that will be a good player, but that's not really the, the nub of the issue. As you pointed out, it's uh this is not the the process that they uh, they need. They need to spend those picks on defense. If assuming you know you don't want to force stuff, but assuming there are good players, defensive players available at fifteen and eighteen, and they need to have a veteran presence in the wide receiver room and somebody who can really play, not some guy who's basically a special teams player who gets on the field for four or five snaps a game. It's it's got to be, you know, somebody who's going to be a leader of that group on and off the field. And they're not going to have that this year, it looks like. Here's the good news. Uh, if you put J.J. Arcega Whiteside as a second-round pick into the mix, if the Eagles are going down the Lions Road again, four times a charm. The yeah. fourth one was uh, <laughs> Megatron, Calvin, yeah. Calvin Johnson. So that's who's yeah. coming to Philadelphia here this year <laughs> in the draft, if it plays to the Lions way of doing things. That means Jody wants Drake London. Yeah. <laughs> Which I know is not the case. Yeah, not the case. No, um, I don't want I don't no. I, USC wide receivers, not just Aguilar, but you know, I've seen a lot of USC wide receivers for whatever reason just not live up to Keyshawn's coming to get you, Les. Yeah, that was that was a very long time ago. Yeah. Uh, Damn. <laughs> I was I was gonna go Lynn Swan if Keyshawn's a very long time ago. Yeah. Well, I'll that's... go way, way, way too <laughs> yeah. far back. Yeah. I, uh, Les, I want to uh, get your feeling on the fact that uh, I don't know how comforted you are, but I was to know that the Eagles are just fine at safety because they've got Kayvon Wallace and Andre Sachere, uh <laughs> as per Howie yesterday, that uh, they've got a yeah. lot of depth at the safety position already on the roster. I get it. He's not tipping his hand. He doesn't want to tip his hand. Um, right. Does this tell you that even if, Kyle Hamilton falls down the board to 15. The Eagles aren't going safety. No. Uh, if Kyle no. Hamilton is there at 15, I I can't imagine that they won't take Kyle Hamilton. Uh, okay. Hope so. I think what's going on here is you've got Honey Badger still sitting out there in free agency. The possibility now, the talk that Kyle Hamilton might drop because of positional value or his 40 time or whatever kind of gives them pause. You don't want to sign Honey Badger and then draft Kyle Hamilton. Uh, you know, it's you, – you don't need both of those guys to play the same position. Um, so you're going to – I think what happens is you get to the draft, and if you don't get Kyle Hamilton, then maybe you have Honey Badger or something like him in your back pocket, you know, to, to address that position. I think they'll do something, you know, beyond uh, uh, bringing back Harris, which they've already done. Um, it would be interesting. They, I don't know when they've ever drafted a safety in the first round. Was Bill Bradley a first round pick? No, I they've ne never, never drafted a first yeah. round safety. Never. Even never. Brian Dawkins obviously yeah. was not a first round draft pick, but it's an important position these days. Uh, I don't know 
one of the things here is we don't know a lot about, even though we saw a season of Jonathan Gannon, we're not really sure yet because he was playing mostly with the guys that he inherited from Jim Schwartz. So this defense was constructed around Jim Schwartz's preferences, and we don't really know what Gannon wants. Uh, if he if he values the safety position, obviously Schwartz valued it a lot because yeah. they had you know, <clears throat> Malcolm Jenkins and Rodney McLeod. And, and a few years ago, that was as good a duo as you had in the league. Um, they don't have either one of those guys now. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, is it a big deal to Jonathan Gannon or would he rather have really good linebackers? We, we just don't know. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. I think we'll find out a little bit from this draft about that. Yeah, it was interesting because how he went on that kind of tangent, Les, and he brought up Jim and how much he valued safeties, which kind of, I don't know if you took it, but that meant that Jonathan doesn't value safeties as much as Jim. I don't know if that's the what he was yeah. trying to say, but that's certainly how it came across. On the other hand, they wanted to sign Marcus Williams until they got yeah. priced out of that range right. as as well, so... It's kind of one of those actions versus words, I guess, theme I was talking about. And and that's where I want to shift with you now, because you wrote about this on NJ.com. Not high profile, but the Eagles lost two of their top three scouts uh, in the offseason, Ian Cunningham and Brandon Brown. Um it's a bigger deal than than I think people realize. And and by the way, Andy Weidel might be the GM of the Pittsburgh Steelers after the draft. And then yes, uh, I would have Andy, loved to have been able to ask about yeah. that yesterday as well. Yeah, and Andy was sick. Uh, yeah, and and he, he's usually at these things, uh, but you have to keep an eye on that after the draft as well. But how do how do how do you think the team is handling this? Is it is it a bigger deal? then people realize to lose those guys in, in, in the pre-draft process. Yeah, John, I don't think it's just losing them. It's losing them to NFC teams that you're competing yeah. against. One team in your division, Brandon Brown is with the Giants. Uh, I think that's a, it's a ridiculous situation. I mean, it's like Dr. Strangelove, you know, with <laughs> these teams. It's, I always think about, you know, that scene of he'll see the big board, you know, and that's exactly what it's what the NFL is like. <laughs> He's seen the big board, yeah. Brandon Brown and Ian Cunningham have seen the big board. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Howie's answer to me yesterday was, well, we didn't have the final board quite set when they left. And, you know, the coaches uh, hadn't about, gotten yeah. in there and, you know, established their priorities yet. I no, that's that's icing on the cake. I mean, it should be. I, I think one of the problems with Chip Kelly was that the coaches had too much draft influence. Coaches aren't scouts. They don't spend the entire season on the road. They don't do research on campuses. They don't go talk to, you know, bouncers at the college bars and, and uh, you know, dorm advisors and people that really know these guys, they see some film, they watch a game and say, Oh, look at that guy. You know, it, that, uh, no, I mean, coaches can tell you what type of player fits their system, but coaches don't dramatically change your draft process. They certainly shouldn't, you know, in terms of who you prefer, who's a better player than that guy, you know, or who is more of a character guy than that guy. Um, I think it's a huge problem for them in this draft. I don't think it'll be a great problem for them going forward, but you know, they got, they went to the NFL <laughs> meetings and got a, a rule passed uh, yeah. where from henceforth, if you're not going to be named the GM uh, somewhere else, you have to have permission from your team. If you're going to move before the draft. And I don't remember, maybe John, you, you have a better memory for the league sometimes than I do guys that have left here and come here over the years. I don't remember it being before the draft. No, it's while. after. Yeah. Joe they, Douglas came here after the bears yeah. draft and he wasn't the bears GM. 
you know. Well, GMs get hired, you know, in January, right. just like coaches. But secondary football executives, right. yeah, their contracts run May to May. So that's how they set it up. So their year is draft to draft. And and that's how that's when you'll see the Eagles right. update their personnel department. It'll come in May after right. the draft because that's you when see scouts comes. move around. Yeah, you don't see yes. scouts move around in February. No, you know, no. I just no. I I was amazed that this happened, and I'm not sure why it did. You know, but uh, I, to me, that's a huge problem for them in this draft that these guys will make moves knowing you know how he wants to do X. You know, and that's uh, wow. That is to me just amazing. Less. Uh, oh, by the way, Andy Weidel uh, sick yesterday. That's why he wasn't up there. Iron City flu, perhaps. Who knows? <laughs> um, yeah, I, that's another thing, man. If he's, I've seen uh, Jerry Dulac, who covers yeah, the, uh, the Steelers, uh, has, has called Andy the front runner for the Steelers GM job. Now, Andy's going to be here for the draft, obviously, but is he going to have one foot out the door while he's drafting these players? And if he does leave, you know, not so much about this draft, but now your whole personnel department has left Got in it. the space of a few months. Yeah. That would seem to be a hell of a thing to me. You know, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that's. Jeff, uh, Jeff Lloyd told us last year they had what, six or seven guys? Or eventually or seven. Become- yeah. yeah. Hey, you got to give Jeffrey credit on that one. He's right. Yeah. The rest of the well, we're going to see how deep that bench is. I yeah. guess. Exactly. Uh, yeah. They, the guy's moving up quickly up the bench of the Eagle executives and scouts. Yeah. All right. I uh, wanted to get your take on this, Les. Yesterday, how he did his best tap dance routine around a lot of issues. He got a little expansive in describing what a linebacker can do for an NFL defense these days uh, off ball on ball uh in the passing game ability to cover out of the backfield maybe more so than any other position that he was asked about he decided to give his insight as to what a draftable linebacker looks like these days in the national football league just top of mind stuff was he tipping his hand a little bit that the eagles are interested in linebacker in this draft or this was this a case of classic misinformation? Let me lead him down the linebacker path because yeah. let's be honest, we just don't put a big value on linebackers here in Philadelphia. Would you read on the fact that he gave you more insight and info on linebacker than maybe any other position we talked about yesterday? Well, I put a lot of weight in what he said about different defensive coordinators having different positions that they really value. And I think maybe Gannon, Jonathan Gannon values linebackers a little more than the last few defensive coordinators we've had here. Um, well, again, we don't really know that, but he comes from the Colts where they do have, you know, Darius Leonard. Darius Leonard. Uh, it, it's, it seems likely that I'll put it this way, given that they have two first round picks and a second round pick, if there's going to be a year where there's going to be a linebacker in one of the, in that mix somehow, maybe not the first round, but certainly the second, this is, this should be the year. <laughs> I mean, it really kind of lines up uh, with need. Uh, they just don't have elite talent there. And uh, they did sign a, a good free agent, but on a one year deal, they are in what they call a building phase of their defense. And it just seems like, you know, I I kind of look for it, but I also know last year going to the draft, the one thing I thought I knew was that they draft a corner in the first two or three rounds, and it was fourth round <laughs> before yeah. they got around to drafting a corner. And I'm still kind of surprised and puzzled by that. But I do think this is – there's an excellent chance this year. I, I think it lines up pretty well. There's a – there's several guys that people talk about. I believe they might have had N'Kobe Dean in there yesterday uh, for a visit um, from Georgia. Um, you know, I, I think this could be the year that either first or second round. I mean, they've gone second round for a linebacker before, but not in 10 years since Michael Kendricks. 
Uh, I think you could see one of those picks go to a linebacker, certainly. All right, Jerry Robinson, you're on alert. Uh, from Lesko in 1979. We'll see if it happens. I Certainly did that there. story once uh, for the yeah. Daily News. I called up Jerry and said, hey, you know, it's been six, six <laughs> number of years since you were the last. He was like, nah, come yeah. on. <laughs> and by the way, the ironic part is Jerry was a really good player. He was like yes. a, a two-time All-Pro. So you would think that would steer him more towards. And obviously that goes way past even Jeffrey Laura. Jeffrey Jerry Lloyd. had played for the Eagles coach, Dick yeah. Vermeil, in college. He's a UCLA so guy, guy, yeah. Um, injuries, less because it, you talk about linebackers being logical. The Eagles have a lot of history with taking injured players recently. Mm-hmm. It worked with Landon Dickerson last year. It did not work with Sidney Jones a couple years ago. Uh, this year you have Jameson Williams at a position of need coming off a torn ACL in the national championship game. You have David Ojabo at a position of need coming off a torn Achilles at his pro day. Same exact thing that happened to Sydney, by the way. Um, How do you think the Eagles handle these things? And I want to marry this to the off season work as well, because Nick Sirianni got asked about that. Eagles are one of two teams. Um, not having mandatory men in camp. They're coming in a week later than you're allowed. Um, is this purely medical decisions, Dr. Arsh Denota, or, or do Howie uh, and, and, and Nick Sirianni put their thumbs into this? Because I don't get the feeling this is Nick's decision. I've yet to meet the football coach that doesn't want to practice. Right. Yeah, I'm a little surprised by that part of it, John. It's uh... – Certainly they did have better injury luck last season. You could argue that they were just due, that it was the law of averages, you know, that they'd had so many ridiculous years of, you know, four and five guys at such at this position or that position corner off offensive line uh, getting hurt, that they were just due for a good year. But they are forfeiting a lot of time that could be spent on the field. And, uh, you know, I I can't imagine that's really optimal in terms of getting your team ready to play. Um, but the whole medical thing, Williams has an ACL. Yeah. And if that's all there is to it, if it's not like a multi-ligament injury, then I'd be pretty confident taking him and figuring you're going to have him in October or November at worst, you know, full strength, and he's probably not going to have, you know, huge problems with that going forward. Achilles a little different, as we learned with Sidney Jones. Achilles pro day, you know, Sidney's agent, I remember this very, very well, was insisting, oh, you know, he could be ready. Yeah, he's, he's really far along in his rehab. He could play, you know. And it, it, Sydney ended up getting in one game, I think, at the end. Yeah, of the it was season. week seventeen. I think it was. The uh, and game. it was a lost year for him, and it kind of put him on a bad path. Uh, he had a really spindly frame; still has it, I guess, out there in Seattle, <laughs> uh, with with really skinny legs, and he kept getting leg injuries, uh, hamstrings. Uh, curiously enough, I don't think he had as many of those out in Seattle last year, and and got a contract with them. Uh, yeah. Apparently pretty played deal. pretty well. He's not a terrible player. He just, he had really bad entry luck. I think his confidence dropped. I think Schwartz didn't like him for whatever reason, personality wise. Uh, you know, there was a lot going on there. I'm not sure I would want want the Achilles guy, a job. I think they really, unless you're just willing to write off 2022 and, and, and have this guy come in in 2023 uh, realistically, rather than do what they did with Sidney Jones and have people waiting for something that isn't going to happen and make it sort of a, make him sort of a disappointment right out of the gate, which I think is what happened with Sidney Jones because he couldn't play that year. You know, I think you have to be really careful with stuff like that. You have to be really careful with Achilles because it's a big injury in terms of explosiveness and, uh, 
I don't think medicine has gotten as far as it has with ACLs. You know, ACLs 30, 40 years ago were like, oh, my God, career ending injuries. They aren't anymore. Achilles aren't career ending injuries, but they're career affecting injuries for a lot of guys. Yeah. More than people really realize. And uh, I'd be more leery of the pass rusher with the Achilles than the wide receiver with the ACL, if that makes any sense. All right, Les, one of your compatriots, yours and John's, down the Eagles' beaten path, if you get my drift. Uh, Brandon Lee Gowton jumped aboard with us earlier this week. And in speaking about Jalen Rager, he said, does not belong on the team, <laughs> doesn't go 100%. How can you have a guy like this here? Howie Roseman yesterday speaking about Jalen Rager said, hey, he's busting his butt every mm-hmm. day to get better. Couldn't have more diametrically opposite opinions right. on the particular player. Now, the Eagles have a reason to spin it a specific way, but they have the up close and personal look. A guy like BLG is looking from afar on the outside looking in. Doesn't mean you can't be right. Just means you don't have as much hands on information as the team does. Who's closer to being right? Well, I don't, I'm not down there like Brandon. I don't really know, but I don't really expect any great renaissance from uh, Jalen Rager this season. Obviously, Howie is, is the guy that drafted Jalen Rager in the first round over Justin Jefferson, and he's got to try to make that look as palatable as he can. You know, it's just, I don't, Rager still has talent, and I think that part of it is true, Um, but he just hasn't put it together. He doesn't – you don't see the results of any kind of work on the field. You don't see consistency. You don't see, you know, great route running. Um, Has something changed this offseason? I don't know. I I guess when the team gets together, maybe we'll be able to tell that a little bit from watching, but uh, maybe he's remade his body. I have no clue, you know, what, what, but at this point, he was just awful last year and it was his second year. And we all know how he's reacted to fan criticism, media criticism. It hasn't been, uh, with resolve it's been with petulance and uh i probably think brandon's probably a lot closer to being right here than than how he is be a heck of a story if jalen rager turned it around and became a productive player but i just don't see it at this point all right last want to end it with you here with a productive player before that follow less on twitter at Les bowen you can read them these days at nj.com with our buddy chris franklin as well their eagles coverage um brandon graham another michigan pass rusher who's 34 coming off an achilles injury which as you mentioned can be a career affecting injury can we expect the normal Brandon Graham coming back at that age from that type of injury. Brandon was on with us here on Jacob media this week, said he wants to play 15 years. That's three more years yeah. less. Now, if anybody can do it, it's Brandon, right. but boy, that's a tough injury at that age. Wouldn't you think? Yes. Yes, it is. I certainly am pulling for the guy. Uh, of, he's one of the most memorable players I've ever covered. I uh, really Sterling person on and off the field leader uh, did a lot to win a Super Bowl for the Eagles. Uh, everybody knows that um, had a terrible, if you remember his draft and what happened oh, yeah. a few years after that, it was almost the same as Jalen Rager. They took him instead of Earl Thomas and yeah. the whole city was ready to you know, burn down the stadium <laughs> for years. I mean, he just, he, he, he had a terrible knee injury. It was actually a bigger injury than we knew at the time. Uh-huh. He had microfracture surgery, uh, which 10 years ago was a pretty big deal. And the defensive line coach, Jim Washburn, didn't want to play him. And it was, you know, he'd been here three or four or five years before. Yeah. He really Chip wanted to cut him. Remember? Yes. He thought he was going to get cut was, for Travis Long. Yeah. 
Travis Long last. Week. Yeah, you know. Uh, so Brandon, I, I can't. I hope Brandon is 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 really Brandon Graham when we see him. Uh, it's possible that he won't be, but I know nobody. I know he put the work in. I mean, yeah. there's no, oh, yeah. there's not going to be any doubt about that. That he attacked rehab and did everything he was supposed to do and more, and is in great shape and is you know going to give every ounce that he has. Uh, but it is a concern, and I think it's, you know, they, they went out and got Hassan Reddick for a reason, um, and they're probably going to address edge rusher very high in the draft as well. But uh, I, I, I don't want to see Brandon Graham uh, stymied by this. I want to see him play those three more years. Last, last thing. One week from now, or one week and a night from now, Let's Bowen will be where eating what? <laughs> you know i for the inquirer the last since 2016 i actually was covering the draft from the draft site but obviously i'm not there anymore i was at the uh cleveland draft last year that was the last big event i guess i did for the inquirer uh, i'm going to be down at novacare this year uh with chris franklin and uh and john and uh, we'll see uh, what what uh, they have in the cafeteria menu that night. I don't yeah, really. Hopefully, know. it's open for us. I'm excited about that life. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's a pretty good spread, actually. Yeah, yeah. should be yeah. good. Uh, Les, we appreciate you coming on with us today. Uh, check out Les at NJ.com. Uh, still putting it out as good as anybody else. Thanks for putting it out for us today. Well, thank you guys. Take care. Thanks. That Les. is Les Bowen here with us on uh, Birds 365. You know what I thought of when I saw a lesser shot? Masterpiece Theater. Yeah. That we should have been theater. discussing some uh, avant-garde novel rather yeah. than are the Eagles should really going to take a, a big, linebacker in the fourth big, round if, this if, year. If, if he only had a rocking chair with a big oversized book and like an Afghan over his legs. Yeah, it he, been perfect. he looked like he was ready to uh, put forth an episode of Masterpiece Theater. Uh, we'll continue the masterpieces here. McDonald and McMullen, your birds 365 guys coming back in just a couple. At Stateside Vodka, every new customer gets the world's best rocks glass, free. What's that? Uh, a rocks glass? You're telling me that bottle is cut in half? You could say that. Holy shit. And you're telling me I can get one of these glasses for free? That's right. One free rocks glass per customer with each first-time purchase of Stateside Vodka. So good, it just disappears. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today, and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian. In my heart, I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the memories. Go for the view. It goes on forever. Go for the bubbles in your bathtub and in your drink. Go to bed whenever you want. Or don't. Go for him. Go for her. 
go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Mac and Mac guys on Birds 365. Hour number two coming your way. Mike Sielski on this for the Inquirer. We'll jump aboard and talk all things Bird with us uh, coming up in less than 20 minutes from now. Um, John, someone disagrees with you. About what? I can't you believe have, it. You have been rather outspoken about uh, the talented wide receiver slash running back of the San Francisco 49ers, the added value that Debo Samuel brings to the table, but specifically the fact that he does so for the San Francisco 49ers and the fact that uh, Kyle Shanahan et all out there by the Bay are the ones who have figured out best how to use them and get the most out of them. Well, the guy who disagrees with you is Debo, Debo Samuel. Samuel. Yeah. He doesn't necessarily agree that he brings more value to San Francisco or that his unique usage is in his best uh, advantage that uh, although there are no quotes from Debo Samuel, it was pretty widely reported yesterday that he has requested trade from the San Francisco 49ers. I guess I understand where he's coming from. He's seeing what Devontae Adams is getting as far as a contract goes and they don't hand the ball off to Devontae Adams. They just throw the ball to Devontae Adams. So he believes that he needs to be a guy who is a wide receiver and a wide receiver only to make that kind of money. Is he cutting off his nose despite his face here, John? Well, yes and no. I understand. I said now it makes sense when I said, because the story didn't make sense to me when it first broke because San Francisco was willing to give him the money, willing to give him the extension. So it wasn't about money. Um, and everyone said, it's about money. It's about no duh. He wants money, but San Francisco was willing to extend him and, and make him one of those, you know, 18 to $22 million receivers. They could have worked that part of it out, but yeah, the interesting part is that Debo Samuel doesn't <laughs> think, um, playing in the backfield makes a lot of sense. So to me, it's a, it's a business decision in that running backs get hurt and your longevity gets hurt. And if your longevity gets hurt, his agent, Tory Dandy is probably pointing out to him, Hey, you could just, you know, make this and be a receiver and go somewhere else. And now the fact that other coaches will be more ineffectual with them, uh, helps, uh, his longevity case. So that part of it makes some sense. Problem is, uh, you're not Devontae Adams as no. a receiver. You can't run the route tree like Devontae Adams. You can't turn defensive backs into a top into the ground and spin them around as one of the best route runners in this league. You're a very, very unique player who... Kyle Shanahan figured out how to use very, very well and very, very effectively. So you got to be careful. Will somebody trade for him and pay him $22 million? Yes. Will he be effective enough to make it past those two years window to just being a receiver? Well, if you compare him to Devontae Adams or Stephon Diggs or Tyreek Hill, Probably not. So it's one of those things you sort of weigh. And it's interesting. I brought up Minka Fitzpatrick because it's, it's, you know, players can think a different way. The Miami Dolphins loved Minka Fitzpatrick, loved him so much. They wanted him to learn the entire defense and play all these different positions and be the Swiss Army knife. And he said, I don't want to do that. That's a lot of work. I just want to play safety and be the best safety and be one of the best safeties. And he got out of there and he went to a situation where they just play him at safety. I always bring up Malcolm Jenkins. He was the exact opposite. He he wanted that. He he craved it. He got bored when you told him just go play safety. Um, players are interesting and they're all different. And you know, when I look at Debo Samuel, you you heard. 
He's my favorite player, Jody. I've said it. My favorite player to watch. The uniqueness, the way San Francisco uses him, his ability to move all, all over, those manufactured touches we always talk about. He doesn't want to do it. Yeah. And there's not much you can do if he doesn't want to do it. Do you believe the 49ers? Uh, I don't want to make it as, as cut and dry as he will be traded, he won't be traded. Will they at least consider it? Will they shop him? Will they see what they could get in return? And if it is enough in their minds, will they pull the trigger on a deal? Do they even go down that road? Because, hey, the, the, I didn't think Tyreek Hill was going to be traded this year. Yeah, he was. If you told me Devontae Adams was going to get the contract that he did, and it was reported after the fact that the Packers absolutely offered the same exact money that Devontae Adams just wanted to go play with his buddy Derek Carr, the West Coast guy, get back out that that he pushed for it, and the Packers relented and said, okay, fine, if you want to be traded, we're going is for are the 49ers at some point just gonna go, yeah, no matter how much we no, he is the key cog. They, forget about quarterback. Eventually, they believe the quarterback will become the key cog, but they're one of few teams in the NFL where the key cog on offense is not the quarterback. Well, if that's the case, how the hell do you trade someone like that? How do you think the 49er thinking is going right now? Well, I think they're going to try to uh, make him change his mind first. But if it comes down to they're not going to hamstring Kyle Shanahan and say you can only play him at receiver, they're not going to do that. And if it comes down to that, they're going to trade him. Um, they're going to chalk it up as, you know, he's just an unhappy player. He doesn't want to be involved. But the, you can't tell a head coach, uh, especially one that has made Debo Samuel into the, the player he has the way he has, uh, oh, you can't do this. You can't You can't put him in the backfield. He doesn't want to do that. You can't run a football team that way. So if if, if that's the end game of, of Debo and, and Torrey Dandy and saying he doesn't want to play that, then he's got to go. I mean, there's no way around that. Uh, and another team can easily say, yeah, we'll just bring you in as a receiver because – a, they probably don't have the coach to utilize them anyway. And B, it's easy to just insert somebody as a receiver and say, okay, go run these routes and just run the plays. And can't do it if you're San Francisco because you've already done the other things. And you'd be really, really hamstringing your head coach uh, in the locker room so many different ways. You can't do it. All right, so if San Francisco is going to be forced to go down this road, Eagles jump in? No, no. They're certainly not going to pay him $22 million to dictate what he can do in the offense. I mean, that's just not how the Eagles do business. And, you know, all these decisions, and people probably get tired of it. I get tired of it. The Eagles, and I say this all the time, the Eagles – most of their decisions, the vast majority of the, their decisions in the moment make a whole lot of sense to me. So that's not the problem. I always use that term vacuum. In a decision, in a vacuum, no, they're not going to bring him in. No, they're not going to go to $19 million for Christian Kirk. They're not going to go to $14 million for Marcus Williams. Um, you know, they're not going to overpay for Stephon Gilmore. Agree, 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 agree. I agree with every single one of those decisions in the vacuum. You get outside of the vacuum, you lost that player, you lost this player, you're not in on this player, you lost this player. It's a little bit different. And that's why it's very, very hard to be disciplined. Uh, the Eagles are one of the more disciplined teams in the NFL. I've argued maybe they're too disciplined at yes. times. But, all right. If we want to argue that, then I'm going to go pay A.J. Brown or D.K. Metcalf. But now it looks like A.J. might be getting a deal with Tennessee, but we'll see how that shakes out. I'm not going into business with a player who is dictating how you can use him. You can't do it that way. Only bad organizations will do it that way. Somebody will do it, and there's a lot of bad organizations. I'm looking at you, Jacksonville, if you have any money left. Somebody will do it. 
It's not going to be the Eagles. All right, so if they're not in on any of these other veteran wide receivers, then we know they're taking a wide receiver with one of those first two picks, right? Has to be. If you tell me they're not trading for Debo Samuel, that A.J. Brown is staying put, that we know they made efforts to get veteran wide receivers via both trade and free agency this year and swung and missed on every one of them. Some were just a nasty pitch. You got to give credit to the opposition. It wasn't like they took a uh, bad way. Just a hell of a pitch. They're shut out. They're going back to the dugout with the bat on the shoulder. Doesn't matter whether they took good cuts or not. The only thing that matters is results. All right, you're up again for the second time now. The draft is just around the corner. Is it a foregone conclusion? One of those two top picks is a wide receiver. I think it's a foregone conclusion. One of the top 51 picks is a wide receiver. I think, um, I would lean towards more than 50% of wide receiver in the first round, but I don't think he can come out of that top 51 without a wide receiver. I think that's the drop dead uh, spots and you need more talent at the position. They had a seat change. They tried to get the veteran. The market exploded. Now they want to go a different way. I don't think it's the best case scenario. You know, that kid from Georgia who tore his ACL, um, Pickens, um, there's another value. I should have brought him up in the injury conversation with Les. There's a guy probably be a top 15 pick if he didn't get hurt uh, and wasn't able to play the season, so kind of fell on the radar. Maybe he slips to 51. You can go about it that way. Um, But they got to get a receiver at the top of the draft. I and uh, I, I remember Pickens as a freshman being as good as he was. Uh, and he was a guy certainly I knew I was going to have to keep my eye on. But uh, like you said, the, the injuries have, have handicapped him. Is there really going to be a good enough player at 51? I know that uh, the Eagles, you can argue, have actually had more success in the second round than they have the first round. Um, but that that's going to be good enough, a, a wide receiver at 51? Well, probably not, but they're – they're in a building phase. Remember Jody, they're not, uh, they're building. So not right away. I will say a player 51 in this draft will be better than what they have. They'll, they'll get, they'll be able to get a receiver. That's better. No, than when you what say they that, have. you mean wide receiver two and down. You're not yeah. including. No, Devontae no, Smith not, no, always Devante's always put off to the side. In these wide receiver conversation. Devante's good. I'm talking about everybody else. All right. He's he's better than those guys. He's going to be better. Fifty one, you know, throw out a name is going to fall. I don't think Christian Watson's going to fall that far. Um, he'd be somebody they'd be interested in. Pickett's might he might because of the injuries, and he might be a better player. To be honest, that might be a good value pick, really good value pick. Um, they would jump on something like that, but it's 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 deep as a whole because. That's what college is producing these days, wide receivers, which is why it's so re- ironic the Eagles can't find wide receivers in the easiest time to find wide receivers. It's it's a bizarre thing. And then player development comes into it because we talked a little bit about Jalen Rager, and, yeah, BLG was kind of harsh. I said, you know, I, know. I, I never got that feeling from Jalen that he doesn't try. I think he's more of what Les was saying about Sidney Jones just shattered confidence. He's got no confidence. I mean, zero. And I don't, either way, I don't think it's salvageable here in Philadelphia. Um, but they, when they do bring in this receiver, whomever it is, you got to stink and develop them. And, you know, people say, well, they developed Devante. Did they? Yeah. He was pretty. He was Devante pretty. was a pretty finished product. Yeah, when he, he, showed was, up. He, he was a pretty. I give Nick Saban credit for that. And you could say Quaz Watkins. Yeah, a little bit. You know, he's certainly more productive than the average six round pick. So they get a, a little feather in in that cap. But you know, what you need more than that. You need that top tier talent, which would be JJ and Jalen and. They haven't been able to develop those guys. And the thing that scares me about the Eagles developing wide receivers with this coaching staff that's now in place, 
Yeah, they re- we reached out and got a mediocre guy that because the coach likes his work ethic and that he does all the little things that you need out of a wide receiver. This team desperately needed a veteran wide receiver as a big play playmaker, not a guy who is unafraid to put his nose in there and block at the wide out position. But that's the guy that they picked up this year. I, Nick Sirianni is a guy who I think I would like being around. He's a guy who I think I would like to be coached by if I were a football player. He's one of those kind of guys. But I don't know that that's a strong suit of him yet. I know that's where his path came from, and that he's a former wide receiver himself, and he loves to talk about ball when we're talking about wide receivers. But I've not seen the evidence that he can take a, a, a hunk of clay as a wide receiver and mold them into a overachieving individual. Sirianni hasn't shown me that. The, and the biggest thing that he's done since he's taken over is, yeah, let me go get my old coat guy who is unafraid to go out there and block, block, block like a maniac. Well, it's not, I, I will say it's not Nick's fault that they haven't been able to get a better veteran receiver. Um, but as far as the development aspect, yeah, that's why they were brought in. That's how the Eagles spun this thing. Oh, this staff is good on de- player development. And I I said last year how much Nick Sirianni spent with the receivers in training camp. It got to the point where I'm like, is this guy the head coach? I mean, he's got to do other stuff. He was spending so much stinking time with the receivers. Um and the proof is in the pudding. All right, you, you you know, if you want to be the class is half full guy, you can point to Devontae and Quez, and you and I are on agreement with Devontae Smith. Devontae, the first day I saw Devontae Smith, I remember, you probably don't remember because you're on the air a uh, 100 million times on 100 million shows, Jody. So I, I understand it. But the first time I saw him, I said, this guy's just different than any other receiver they have. I mean, he showed up and he was better, a better route runner than anybody they've had in years. And they had some good route run. Nelson was a good route runner. Nelson Aguilar was, his problem was catching the football, tracking the football. He could get open. Deshaun Jackson was a heck of a route runner. People think of him as a deep threat. He was a heck of a route runner. Devontae is like, you know, he's got a chance to be, Adams dig stealing level route runner. I mean, he is great uh, already. And obviously if he, you know, cleans up the attention, the detail, he can be even better. And, and then Quez, Quez is the one where he can say, okay, there was certain, he certainly, he got better. Jalen Rager got worse. JJ got worse. Greg Ward got worse as a, uh, as a player, you know, understanding where he was shifting from quarterback to, to wide receiver, but Greg Ward was effective and he got worse um, under this group. And that's, that's the scorecard Jody right now. And for a guy who, if, if that were just the scorecard for any coach, you go, all right, not good. But when you're coming in as a guy who's a former receivers coach, that that's supposed to be your strong suit. That that's one of the things you're leaning on. That's not a great scorecard at all for uh, the head coach of Philadelphia Eagles. Hopefully it improves this year. And hopefully uh, part of that improvement is the guy that they take at either 15 or 18 in the draft. I think they're going first round wide receiver, but we shall see. All right. Mac and Mac guys, John McMullen, Jody McDonald. We're scheduled to be joined by Mike Sealski. Top columnist here in Philadelphia has been for years. He's the inquirer going to jump aboard with us here on Birds 365.
At Stateside Vodka, every new customer gets the world's best rocks glass, free. What's that? Uh, a rocks glass? You're telling me that bottle is cut in half? You could say that. Holy shit. And you're telling me I can get one of these glasses for free? That's right. One free rocks glass per customer with each first-time purchase of Stateside Vodka. So good, it just disappears. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today, and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian. In my heart, I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the memories. Go for the view that goes on forever. Go for the bubbles in your bathtub and in your drink. Go to bed whenever you want. Or don't. Go for him. Go for her. Go for the win. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. Appreciate you streaming it. Streaming on in on the Jacob Media YouTube channel for the Mac and Mac. Let's get an informed third voice in to get McMullen and myself up to speed here. Uh, He has been the lead columnist in town for damn close to a decade now. Always good to talk Eagles. None other venues. I'll talk other things with him. But we'll stick to the birds today here with Mike from the Inquirer. Mike, always like to ask this question in a locked time zone phrase. Today, today's date. The Philadelphia sports scene, Sixers are 3-0 over Toronto. Phillies hit yesterday, but a bit of disappointment so far. We have a hockey team here that we're not acknowledging in town. (laughs) Where did the Eagles fit into the Philly sports scene mix seven days before? Jay Wright, too. I was just going to say, John, Jody, you left out the the biggest story. Shame on me. Sorry. I I, I was narrowly focused on the four major teams and the professional teams. I apologize, Jay Wright. <laughs> I was going to say, o- only in Philadelphia could the best coach in college basketball yeah. shock everybody by retiring, and it might be the third biggest story in and around the city. Um, that's only Philadelphia. Where do the Eagles fit in? The Eagles are always somewhere near the top. Um, and this is the NFL draft, which has become in some ways, dare I say, like close to the Super Bowl in terms of the draw that – it has to fans um, and people who follow, you know, the, the 32 teams in the league. Um, so right at this moment, it probably feels like the Eagles are a bit of an afterthought in the wake of Jay's retirement and Joel's shot and Kyle Schorber's moonshot yesterday in Colorado. But rest assured, as the, the draft gets closer, they'll be at top of mind for everybody. Yeah, and it is interesting with Jay, as you mentioned. I mean, that guy is a coaching heavyweight, by far the best coach, I think, in in Philadelphia over the past two decades. Um, You know, but some people get into that Bill Nova talk. Is it really Philadelphia, Mike? You got to get past that hump. You know, Uh, uh, somebody somebody phrased it this way, John, and I think it's perfect. I forget who it was. I don't want to take credit for it. Villanova is not a Philadelphia school but Villanova is a Philadelphia basketball program and I think that's the way to the right way to frame it well and they play at Wells Fargo Center right. and the banners are at Wells Fargo Center but yeah I'm and, and and still through it all 
you have that coaching heavyweight and, you know, Hall of Famer. And, yeah, it gets lost in the shuffle. The Eagles are among it, which is this city's passion. So it's a little bit, as you mentioned, but the NFL has turned the draft into a mini Super Bowl, essentially, when it comes to taking it from city to city. And these this time, places like Cleveland last year, they can't bid on the Super Bowl, but they can get an NFL draft. Vegas is getting it this year. Um, you weren't there. Marcus was there. But uh, I assume you took in Howie uh, and, and just your general thoughts of, of, of where he went and anything surprised you, anything eye-opening to Mike Sealski. Or he's Nothing. been doing this too long. He's too good. Yeah, no, nothing really. I mean, I watched it. I read the transcript. This is Howie bobbing and weaving. And, you know, I've been one of these people who's been saying it for a long time. Don't listen to what they say. Yeah. Watch what okay. they do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he got it. You guys, you know, the, the reporters and media members who were there asked all the right questions, particularly about what the trade with the Saints means and the accumulation of these picks, particularly with respect to Jalen Hurts. And, you know, he gave you the pat answer of we love Jalen Hurts and we believe in him. And that's all fine and good until Jalen Hurts, you know, completes 60 percent of his passes and, you know, throws a couple, you know, picks that uh, maybe another quarterback theoretically wouldn't throw. And they decide, you know what, we can do better in the draft next year. Um, So, you know, nothing really out of the ordinary that I saw from Howie yesterday. All right, uh, I am intrigued by your stance on the upcoming NFL draft, Mike Sielski, that it's almost like Super Bowl light. John kind of hinted at his stance. I want to get yours. Why do you think that is? I think it's a combination of factors, Jody. I think, number one, and this gets undersold, I think the draft unites the two biggest sports in this country in a way that no other event does, professional football and college football. You have fans are watching not just to find out if their favorite NFL team is going to draft a player who's going to lead them to the Super Bowl or help them win the Super Bowl. That's obviously the overriding factor, certainly in a market like Philadelphia. But we forget how wide and deep the fan bases are of the college teams that these guys are coming from. And, you know, the I think a lot of people, for instance, in Alabama watch the draft and say to themselves, oh, okay. Nick Saban had another four or five guys taken, another two or three guys in the first round. That can only help the Crimson Tide going forward because that reaffirms that Alabama is the place to be if you want to get picked high in the NFL draft. And so those two forces are, you know, I don't think we talk about that enough. And I think it's that those are huge. Um, I think everybody wants to be a general manager now. And because, you know, and because the All-22 film and college tape is available now to be seen by everyone, uh, some of the mystery of the draft is gone, right? Like when the, go back to when the Eagles drafted Donovan McNabb. Yeah, you might have watched Donovan McNabb play on Saturday afternoons at Syracuse, but you couldn't do a deep dive into him the way everybody's doing a deep dive into Kenny Pickett this year. Um, And in some ways, (laughs) the opinions of a layman might be just as valid as the opinions of a scouting director of an NFL team, um, because we're all seeing the same thing. So, you know, I think people like to play GM. They like to say, oh, it was smart for this team to take that quarterback at that time, or here's the guy who's going to be the sleeper. And all of that intrigue just adds to um, the draw of the spectacle that is the draft. Your your take was my first take. That's exactly where I was going, because... I've been around long enough. Uh, My buddy Dave T. Thomas used to put out a draft guide. And it was like Christmas. Talk about Christmas and and compared to the Super Bowl. When I got my Dave T. Thomas draft guide in the mail, I I would just like sit down for six straight hours and read for six straight hours. Why? I couldn't get that information anywhere else. But now with the expanse of technology and video and everybody's got a blog and a website and information and like, Yeah, you could sit back at home and say, I know better than Howie Roseman. 20, 25 years ago, you didn't know better than the general manager of your team. You crossed your fingers. You uh, just looked up to the sky and prayed that he knew what he was doing. It is so changed in a period of time. That's why I think it's become almost Super Bowl-like. More so, your point about the college and the pro games coming together is good. John's point about 
them actually hosting it and being able to pull in 150, 200,000 over the course of a weekend is good. I tell you, it's because it's personal participation. People know better than Howie Roseman in this town. Well, they've yeah. always thought that. Yeah, yeah, and, and the other thing too, Jody, the one thing that kind of distinguishes it from the Super Bowl, right, is the Super Bowl is the primary sporting event in the country where people who aren't big football fans will watch, right, generally speaking. Yeah. You know, the draft is kind of the opposite. It is Christmas for everybody who really loves the sport and really thinks that they know it. And so that gets, you know, the audience is, is vast, but in some ways it's even more passionate because it's, it's all these people like us who think we know or want to know. And that adds to the, the draw and the intrigue too. Yeah. And how he brought up an interesting, when he went on one of his tangents, he brought up Ryan Grigson, uh, who's an ex personnel guy here now out in Minnesota talking about Andy Studebaker. Uh, if you remember him, Mike, he brought in a, a disc of Andy Studebaker, how he's like, nobody knew this guy. Nobody knew who this guy was. Now, you know, it would have been nice if Andy turned into a great player, but right. you don't have that anymore. Like he said, whoever we pick in the third round, you're going to know who that is. Everybody knows who these players. So we're in the information age. Um, do you think that has shifted? the difficulty of the draft, the fact that everybody knows these players, the fact that um, there's so much, uh, there's so much of a microscope on things, group think, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of, is it tougher to go out of the box for one of these small school players that maybe aren't quite as known as those Alabama guys, Georgia guys, SEC guys. Does that make it a little bit more difficult? I think it probably does, John, because what you're talking about is thin slicing the evaluations of these guys. You know, you start to look at things that are so small, um, you know, and try to read their character or their work ethic or their background, or it's this one thing that they did or said in the interview. You know, that's, I think that's probably part of the reason that for all the you know, lighthearted ridicule and mocking that, that the Eagles and Nick Sirianni have taken for some of the measures that they use in their draft interviews, um, <laughs> that, that those sort of things, they feel like they have to do them because if, if everybody's got access to all the same information, how often are you going to uncover a diamond in the rough? Because th where's the rough anymore? Unless you're finding Jordan Mailata on Australia where are you going to unearth these diamonds that nobody else can find? Everybody can find everybody now. I mean, how long did it take for Carson Wentz in 2016 to go from a really good Division I AA quarterback to being a guy who people whose opinions count in these things were saying, this guy could be the number one pick in the draft. Like that was, it was meteoric in every sense of the word. And it was suddenly because everybody had access to Wentz's college tape and everybody kind of came to the same conclusion. 10 years earlier, 15 years earlier, 20 years earlier, that would have been a completely different situation. Um, you know, the, if the Eagles had, had traded up to pick a guy from North Dakota State, kind of out of the blue, it would have been looked at like, what the hell are they doing? But nobody looked at it that way because everybody could see Wentz's tape and everybody kind of agreed, boy, he has a chance to be a really good prospect, you know, the last few years notwithstanding <laughs> this week we know the pressure is squarely on howie roseman's shoulders despite the fact that the eagles tell us every single year it's a collaborative effort although jeff laurie says he's doing less than he used to do all right we'll see he's only involved with three picks over 25 yes. years Jody. and damn he was good on all three of those picks <laughs> um but they're leaning on the coaching staff second year rather than first year but we all know this is Howie's time of year. He's going to either get a lot of credit for it or get a lot of grief for it one way or the other a year or two down the line. Uh, Jonathan Gannon, second year coach, he was up in front of the media answering questions yesterday. He's just as uh, devoted to defense as he is to offense. He's the head coach now. A guy who I think there's a lot of pressure on coming into this year is their defense coordinator, Jonathan Gannon, who Howie Roseman said, we're just renting him because he's going to get a head coaching job somewhere else soon enough. I had uh, one interview with Houston this year. The reason I think that's the case is he has to use the Eagles' best free agent off-season uh, off acquisition 
just perfectly because he is kind of a tweener. Is he a down defensive lineman? Is he an outside linebacker? How is Hassan Reddick going to be used? Uh, I know you heard it yesterday. We referred to it earlier on the show. Eagles good at safety. They've got Andre Sachere. <laughs> so they're just fine at safety. Or that's the painting that how uh, the picture that how we trying to paint yesterday. They need to find a safety and what kind of a safety is going to be. There's some serious pressure on uh, uh, the Eagles defense coordinator, Coach Gannon, coming into this year. Is he up to the task, Mike? I don't think he was as bad as every as certain people made him out to be uh, last year. And I think if you look at the accent of what they're what they've done in this offseason and what they're probably going to do, I think that reaffirms it. Look, they're not good at safety. And they're, you know, they weren't great last year and they're worse now for Rodney McLeod not being around. Um, you know, there's a reason they went out and got Hassan Reddick. It's because their pass rush wasn't very good. And, you know, if you're Jonathan Gannon, you can only make so much chicken salad out of chicken you know what. And um, that doesn't mean he was perfect. Um, but it does mean that, look, if, if you're going to evaluate Jonathan Gannon just on what he does with Hassan Reddick, um, you know, that's, that's a, that's a tough standard to kind of meet. Um, you know, I, the Eagles are interesting to me because anything, any kind of argument you have about them, any kind of <clears throat> observation you try to make based on last year can be counteracted, right? Like, yeah, they, they got, they got better in the second half of the year and they made the playoffs. Yeah. But look at the caliber of their competition. Um, Jonathan Gannon was too passive and, and didn't blitz enough. Yeah. But look at his personnel, you know, would you blitz and take chances with the, the 11 that he was rolling out there pretty much every week? Yeah. Jalen hurts, um, you know, had a pretty good season and got them to the playoffs and makes key winning plays. Yeah. But look at him in the Tampa Bay playoff game. So, um, there's a pressure, there's pressure on a lot of people here, Jody. And I don't think it's necessarily fair to judge Gannon, um, until we get a full sense of what his personnel are and how he can fully deploy them. If he wants to cut, if, if they are, if their personnel is significantly better on defense and they're still playing the same kind of schemes that they played last season. All right, then we can take a hard look at Gannon, but I got to think that some of what he was doing last year is taking a look around and saying, you know, I got to staunch the bleeding as much as I can, because most of the guys I have in this defense can't play. Yeah, fair point, Mike. Um, I want to talk about one of the themes of this offseason that's been for the Eagles, really you know, amongst the fan base, and that is uh, missing out on players. And that's the perception. The Eagles push back on this behind the scenes. And if you look at the individual situations, it makes sense. You know, Russell Wilson didn't want to come to the East Coast. Deshaun Watson didn't want to mess with uh, Jalen Hurts' opportunity is the reporting there. They they got close uh, in the offseason working with Quincy Avery. Christian Kirk got $19 million. The Eagles said, all right, Godspeed. Um, Marcus Williams at safety, as you point out. Don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. They were in on Marcus Williams. Got $14 million. They said, Godspeed again. Um, Allen Robinson. Wanted to go play with the Super Bowl champions. Robert Woods decided he wanted to play with the number one seed in the AFC. Each individual case, there's there's an explanation. And it's a good one, to be honest. For the most part, I agree with the Eagles. But then you got the bigger picture. You keep missing out on players. You miss, you miss, you miss, you miss, you miss. Does it become a self-fulfilling prophecy if you're too disciplined? If you're, we've been through this with, with the Sixers to a larger degree. If I'd like to call it the we're not ready crowd, you get this whole, we're not ready. When are you ready? When is there ever a perfect moment? So sort of that theme of the Eagles missing out on players. You think it's real? You think it's manufactured in between? I think it's real to a degree. Um, you know, you think about uh, something uh, to, to take things in a, into one of Jody's favorite realms, baseball. Um, you think about something that Andrew Friedman, uh, I believe he's with the Dodgers now still, uh, general manager has been around for a little while, you know, really forward thinking guy once said, which is if you're too disciplined, I'm paraphrasing, but if you're too disciplined in your spending, 
you'll end up finishing third in every race for every free agent, right? At some point, you have to shell out money. And I think there's, there's a lot of truth to that. Sometimes you have to overpay. I think circumstances matter. And I think one of the, the dynamics that's at play here is the perception of where a team is in its rebuilding or its place or status within the league, particularly with respect to the quarterback position. I'll give you a quick example of what I mean. During the summer of 2017, after the Eagles had signed Alshon Jeffrey, um, and this is going to be really ironic for people who follow the Eagles closely, I went down to um, Orangeburg and St. Matthew, South Carolina to do a deep story about Alshon. And I had lunch one day with his brother, Charles. And I'm talking to him about why Alshon decided to sign with Philadelphia, with Philadelphia, with the Eagles. And one of the things that Charles told me was, um, you know, he, he thinks he can win a Super Bowl like now, especially mm-hmm. because of the quarterback they just, they just got, yep. you know, yep. now think about that in the context of what happened between Alshon Jeffrey and Carson Wentz. <laughs> but at that time, that was the perception of the Eagles was they had moved up to get a young up and coming quarterback. He had just played all 16 games of his rookie season. And it looked, you know, inconsistent, but pretty good. And they were the hot new thing. And certainly, I think that helped them that offseason to sign some of the veterans they signed, whether it was Alshon, whether it was Torrey Smith, uh, maybe Chris Long, you know, players like that who went on, LeGarrette Blount, who went on and made a difference and helped them in the Super Bowl run. So I think that those kinds of perceptions are real, but they are quick and they're fleeting. And I don't think that the Eagles are one of those teams that is perceived right now to be a hot place to be. Um, and some of that is Jalen Hurts. Some of that is what is, is the residue of what happened with the, the falling out and the exit of Carson Wentz. Um, but it's just not where they are right now. And I think that probably is a factor, at least for certain offensive players. Can't speak, you know, it's probably uh, thinner gruel when it comes to defensive players signing here. But certainly on offense, I think that's probably a, a factor is, you know, they're not completely committed to Jalen Hurts. You know, around the league, we're not sure that Jalen Hurts is really the guy yet. He hasn't really proved it. So do you really want to go there and take that chance? Funny how uh, Andrew Friedman said what he did about every once in a while, you just got to jump in the deep end of the pool. He didn't wait until he got to the Dodgers, who had the right. capability of <laughs> right. jumping exactly. into the yeah. He never said that when he was in Tampa. Yeah. He in, in Tampa that and, to himself. Right. Yeah. In Tampa, the deep end of the pool was only three feet. In, in <laughs> Los Angeles, it's it's 12 feet. Yeah, yeah, you better jump in, not dive in. You crack your skull on the uh, <laughs> on the bottom of the pool at three feet. Um, I tying in with what you were just talking about, Eagles and perception around the league. Uh, this past off season, this off season we're in. I think the Eagles have lost out on a couple of players because, specifically, wide receivers. They saw what the Eagles did in the second half of last year. Run dominant team. Jalen Hurts only threw it X amount of times a game. Do I really want to go there? Am I going to get my numbers, my catches, my yards? They'll probably come into this season. I know they're going to come in, going to try and throw it more. How much more we're going to have to wait and see and find out. There's the possibility that they could do that all preseason, the first four, five, six, seven, eight, nine games, halfway point of the season. That's when they change. I would say it was more the fact that they let Derek Carr pick them apart than anything else, but they knew they had to do something different. They decided to turn to the run, and it worked for them. Are they going to be more or less stringent about the way of winning football in the National Football League in 2022 is to air it out? Or will they once again go, hey, we got to do what we do best, and with our five guys up front and their ability to run block, we got to go back to that again. You're saying later, if not at all, this upcoming year? I am saying the Eagles have been upfront about how they want to play offensive football for the better part of two decades. And they only resort to the kind of offense that we saw last season when they feel like they have to, when they are desperate. They don't want to play that way. I wrote a column about this after they uh, they gashed the Detroit Lions 44-6 to and Hurts threw about 15 passes. And I remember coming on with you guys, and John and I talked about this, about how that this was all fine and good, but this is not the way they want to play. They don't believe in it. Jeffrey Lurie and Howie Roseman have been upfront about this. They want a quarterback who can be the center of their offense. They want a quarterback, honestly, in part, who can be the center of their franchise. This is a money-making thing. And 
This is a dynamic I feel like too that that people forget about with respect to the NFL. It's not just that the league set up the rules to allow quarterbacks to make things easier to throw the ball and make things easier for quarterbacks um, to keep their stars around and have them not get hurt so that there's more points and it's more entertainment. Quarterbacks are the stars. Quarterbacks sell merchandise. Th these teams want to make money, and one of the big ways to make money is to have a star quarterback. It is not to you know, grind teams in the dust by handing the ball to Jordan Howard and Miles Sanders and Kenny Gainwell. And th those the Eagles don't want to play that way if they don't have to. And I think they are going to go into this season saying to themselves, we're going to do everything we possibly can to, to give Jalen Hurts the opportunity to show us he can play that way. And if he shows us he can't, we're going to go draft a quarterback. I, I don't see how anybody could see this any other way. I agree, Mike. And at, at some point, that's going to creep in to the thinking of Jalen Hurts. We all act like Jalen Hurts is not affected by this because, for the most part, he comes across like that. He comes across as a really well-grounded uh, person who just comes to work, puts his head down. I think we all appreciate the work ethic that he provides. But at some point, no matter how many times the microphone shows up and the Eagles say, we love Jalen Hurts, we love Jalen Hurts, you mentioned it before in this interview. Don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. That trade was a clear indication that there's a big neon safety net under Jalen Hurts, and everybody can see it, including Jalen Hurts. At some point, um, do the Eagles have to stop this? Does it end next year? Can it possibly go past? We're talking this time next year in 12 months about the draft. Eagles don't take a quarterback. Can they go another year with this? Is it a never-ending, I don't want to call it sixer cycle, but purgatory, stasis, how long can they take this? I would be surprised if they took it very long, John. Um, again, going back and looking at their history, they like to, to find a quarterback. Um, they don't mind, I, I don't think, if they stumble into one, you know, and I think that's what this year is for. It's to give Jalen this one last chance to show that he can stick, right? Like the, the difference between uh, a first round pick, a quarterback who's a first round pick and a quarterback who's a second or third round pick is that the first round pick has to prove to the team that he can't play. And the second or the third round pick has to prove that he can. And that's Jalen Hurts. He has to prove that he can play. So... They're going to give him this year. Go back to the aftermath, for instance, of the 2013 season. You know, my colleague Jeff McClain mentioned the, the 2013 draft in the meeting with Howie yesterday and the similarities between that draft and this one. Well, there's another big similarity. The situation at quarterback for the Eagles was a little unsettled at that time, except the difference then was that I was in the combine. I was at the combine, the 2014 combine, and that was the Eagles coming off of having gone to the playoffs in Chip Kelly's first season and Nick Foles throwing 27 touchdown passes and two interceptions. And if you asked Howie at that combine about the quarterback situation, his response was, we love Nick Foles. We think he has a chance to be terrific. He's our guy. We're going to do everything we can to help him succeed. And then the 2014 season happened. He got injured midway through. He hadn't been playing that well anyway, but they'd been winning. And then he gets, you know, Chip Kelly takes over and he trades Foles for Sam Bradford. And, and the whole idea of how he's playing gets thrown out the window. OK, it's a different scenario this year. You're not hearing them. They're not acting as if Jalen Hurts is the guy that they think is going to stick. They're holding out for the possibility that he won't. And I think they want to get that position settled as quickly as they possibly can. So to answer your question, I would be surprised if. They extend it another year if they franchise him or, you know, don't extend him and give him another year to try to show that he can't do it. They want to be settled at that position. And if Hertz doesn't prove that he to them that he's the guy, I would think they're going to go out and draft one next year. They're saying one thing and whispering sweet nothings in other people's ears. I exactly agree with you, Mike. All right. Uh, since you seem like you had a pretty good gas grasp on Howie Roseman and what the organization really wants, I'm going to make you Howie Roseman. 
and give you a best case scenario, kind of like what you were talking about as well. well. First of all, let's get let's get Jeff on here so that I can make bad jokes and needle him a little bit during oh, yeah. his press yeah. conferences. Not a yeah. goal. Very good. Uh, How we do, always goes for the no, joke. It no, never no, lands. No. But didn't the coach and the general manager seem like they were boys yesterday? More so than ever with Doug. Howie and Doug, they had a good relationship, but it seems like uh, Howie and uh, Sirianni are going out for beers and wings after they had their media <laughs> session yesterday. Just Yes, but, but Nick Sirianni hasn't won a Super Bowl, and he didn't make the play calls that led to them beating the New England Patriots yeah. and Tom Brady and Bill Very Belichick. But, you know. but uh, do you agree or disagree with my staff? They see more boys than Doug and Howie ever seen boys. Yeah, that's true. But I also think Doug felt like I won a Super Bowl. I wrote a book. You know, I should have, you know, I mean, let let's be honest about why he isn't there anymore. He wanted some say so and the Eagles weren't willing to give it to him. Right. I'm not making a yeah. statement on whether it's right or wrong. I'm right. just going. No, you're, you're right, though. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They feel that way. All right. So you're Howie Roseman. You can suck up to your coach or boy up with your coach as much as you feel necessary. All five wide receivers that are considered to be first round draft picks in this upcoming draft are available. For some reason, no one takes a wide receiver in the first 14 picks, and the Eagles have their choice of any of them. What order would you put those five wide receivers in? Williams, Wilson, Alave, London, Burks. You got a Mike Sealski rating for us there, Howie Roseman? I don't. I'm closing my eyes and I'm putting my finger down and whatever name I hit, I hit. Um, look, there's no, I, I'm not a draft, Nick, Jody. I'm just not. Um, okay. I, I approach the draft, honestly, I approach the draft the same way that, that I do the NCAA tournament. You know, people ask me if I fill out a bracket uh, come March and I don't because nobody knows anything. You know, they, they really, they think they know. It's, it's, I go back to Jim Mora. You think you know, but you don't know. And I, I honestly, I don't know. I mean, I, I liked the Devontae Smith pick last year because I, I had seen him play, you know, for Alabama. And I thought it doesn't matter that he that he's pretty small or skinny or whatever he was. That kid just looks like he can play. But that's the extent of I'm not I'm not breaking down tape to the degree that these coaches or the or the, the people who cover the team and cover the league uh, do. Um, I just don't, and I'm not going to pretend to be something I'm not. So you're you're Howie Roseman. Now, we won't take a shot at, at Howie. Mike Sealski, at Mike Sealski, Inquirer.com. Read him there. Obviously, Kobe Bryant and the Pursuit of Immortality, The Rise. You can buy the book, The Rise of KobeBook.com. You can get it there. Mike, last question from me. I'll bring the Sixers back into it because they're making the run. They're 3-0. Tyrese Maxey has turned into quite the player. I think it's ironic. I've always talked about player development in the Sixers. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. They couldn't develop guys. All of a sudden, all this losing, all these people at the top, obviously Joel worked out, but Ben Simmons we know, Markel Bolts not so much. Here comes the, I think it was the 21st pick in the draft, Tyrese Maxey turns into a player. You've got to hit on, go ahead, I'm, I'm sorry, John. We'll put the Eagles ten on it, and then you, you you can go any way you want to it. Sure. But I'm putting Devontae Smith aside because he's a top ten pick. Do you see a Tyrese Maxey on on the Eagles? A guy who's going to come out of nowhere and develop into a star player? I would say the closest thing is probably Quez Watkins um, that they have. You know, sixth round pick showed flashes. Certainly has. Plenty of speed, um, you know, showed signs of being a bit of a playmaker last year. Um, and and it's, it's, a, it's a good analogy, I think, John, because teams that win consistently find guys like that, right? Like the San Antonio Spurs don't have a dynasty just because they happen to get the number one overall pick and in the, in the year to get it and get Tim Duncan. Yeah, They, they find Tony Parker. And they, they draft Manu Ginobili in the second round. And they draft Kawhi Leonard late in the first round. You know, none of those guys were lottery picks. Nope. And, and I totally get the, the logic of, you know, hey, if you're not going to be good, be really bad so that you have a better shot at getting a great player like an Embiid. Or, you know, a year that a, a can't-miss quarterback is available, Trevor Lawrence, Andrew Luck, Peyton Manning, somebody like that. Totally get it. But 
you you have to kind of stumble or be smart enough to make picks like a Maxi, you know, like a potentially a Quez Watkins, you know, Antonio Brown for all his nutty behavior, six round pick, yeah. six round pick you know, and so you have to have those happen. And I would say with respect to the Eagles, looking at that roster right now, you know, you got either, I would say either Watkins or Jordan Maialata are, are the two that stand out to me. No, my lot are not too shabby. Uh, Mikey Mike, we're running late. We appreciate you coming on with us, whatever you do. We'll get you back on in a couple of weeks. Thanks for joining us today. Enjoy the draft on Thursday, bud. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. That is Mike Sielski, uh, the lead columnist here in Philadelphia, has been for quite some time. Always good to get him on to talk birds. Yeah, like Johnny said, you talk Sixers or Phillies or whatever, you get Sealski. You want to talk to him about a bunch of different things, but we are Birds 365, so that's why we stuck to the Eagles for the most part. We'll come back and put a bow on the show here on Birds 365. At Stateside Vodka, every new customer gets the world's best rocks glass. Free. What's that? Uh, a rocks glass? You're telling me that bottle is cut in half? You could say that. Holy shit. And you're telling me I can get one of these glasses for free? That's right. One free rocks glass per customer with each first-time purchase of Stateside Vodka. So good, it just disappears. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today, and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right. Just by talking with Brian in my heart, I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Go for the midnight dares. Go for the memories. Go for the view that goes on forever. Go for the bubbles in your bathtub and in your drink. Go to bed whenever you want. Or don't. Go for him. Go for her. Go for the wind. Go to Ocean Casino Resort. Book your trip at theoceanac.com. All right, Johnny Mac, we got about 16 seconds left here before the hour comes and goes. So we're going to go. A couple of minutes over today, everybody. Stick around with us here on Birds 365. Hit the like button, share with us as uh, well. Just uh, continue to support your boys here on Birds 365. All right, Jay Mack, final question. Debo Samuel uh, reports he wants to be traded. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, will the Eagles actually get involved? You say no. But for a second, let's suspend reality and say the Eagles do have interest in Debo Samuel and uh, they would actually make a play for him. Who would be the best person? Can, of course, be Howie Roseman. That would be tampering, but it needs to be someone to rep for the Eagles to get in touch with Debo Samuel to see if he would be amenable to coming to Philadelphia if a trade could be worked out and sign a contract extension here because 
Philadelphia is the place to be. Who would be the best person to do that behind the scenes <clears throat> reconnaissance? Uh, mm, I'll give you a hint. Diehard Birds fan. Diehard. I think it well. I think it's Slay. Um, he's the official recruiter anyway. But you want it. Why it was Hammond was I got, I got you want better. it to be the quarterback. You I want got it better. to be the quarterback, but it can't be the quarterback. But go ahead. Gold medal winner. Devin Devin Allen. No, I he got didn't better win than Devin Allen. Yeah, he was fourth. I take it back. He did. Another hint. She'd be great. Uh, she'd be great. Um, you're losing me. She'd be it? great. Gold medal winner. Die hard Eagle fan. Um, Carly Lloyd. I don't no. know where are you go. Doing going? her coaching these days south of here. Dawn south Staley. Being key. Oh, South Carolina. Dawn Staley. Okay. Dawn Staley. Yeah. Get Dawn Staley. I on forgot the she was in South Evo Carolina. Samuel right now. And let her tell him how great it is to be in Philadelphia. Because yeah. I don't know if you've seen it, Pro Football Talk. Um, uh, Sims is speculating that Debo just not a California guy. All right. He wants yeah, out of maybe California. That's maybe that's it. Why I'll not tell you Philadelphia? What, you know, you said, I said the Eagles won't be involved. Again, I'm going on the assumption he doesn't want to be utilized in that way. If that isn't the tale, and it and the tale is, um, he's just not a California guy, then that changes things. Yeah. I'm saying if so, if somebody wants to come in and demand, I want to be used like this. The Eagles aren't getting involved in that. It, it, if it's just I don't want to be in San Francisco. Um, I'm a South Carolina guy. I want to come closer to home. He's the type of player they should get. All right, but let me let me ask you this, and I, and I think this is not just a far fetched hypothetical. I think it could be pretty damn close to reality. Here's what he wants to hear: I don't want to carry the ball anymore. No, I, I want to be looked at as just a wide receiver. Can't do that. Can't do that. Really? Good organization. If you're the Philadelphia yeah. Eagles, you'll say no to that. Yeah. Why? Because he's dictating terms. Yeah. Can't tell the coach how to run his offense. Can't do it. Bad road to go down. Bad, bad road to go down. Yeah, but that's not outrageous. Uh, it's pretty outrageous. I give me another example. It's not outrageous. That. How many guys are used like Debo Samuel? None, but you know, so, we're talking so so it's outrageous for a guy to go treat me like every other wide receiver in the league. It's outrageous to tell a coach that he can't run a jet sweep or can't put you in the backfield if he wants to put you in the backfield. That's the outrageous Good. part. Giant. Now, if you want to go down to the arcane and the in the weeds and say I can carry it fifty times, but I can't carry it sixty times. Yeah, I can't get involved with that. I can't get involved. He's good at it. I I want to utilize what he's good at. John, I, I can't I can't go there. I the, can't go there. In the player empowerment era that is sports in 2022, I don't know that that's an outrageous bequest that I don't want to carry the football anymore. I just want to be. Well, I hey, there will be plenty of teams that agree to the, if that is the standard, there will be plenty of teams that agree to it. I don't think they're good organizations if you agree to that is well, my, my point. If that's all that it is, I would be okay with. If he says, I need the ball 11 times a game, I need four <laughs> passes between yeah. 10 and 15 yards, and eight passes between. Yeah, they, you can overstep your boundaries. I, I certainly acknowledge yeah. that. It's and a I'm slippery not going slope. There. But it's if the request slope. is just, I don't want to be the jack of all trades guy anymore. I want to be treated like Devontae Adams. I'm not going to say no. All right, it's a slippery slope. You're, I mean, and that's why I bring up Minka. It was okay for Pittsburgh. It wasn't okay for Miami. Um, but Pittsburgh's a better organization, so uh, it can work. But I've seen the guy, and I want to utilize Debo Samuel. Now, you know, this might be a moot point because I talk about it all the time. 95% of coaches aren't going to be able to do it anyway. So maybe it's a, a much ado about nothing. But just the way the Eagles do business, I, I, I don't think they get involved in that. Go on. 
do us a favor, a little reconnaissance work. See if you can get on the phone with uh, Debo and see exactly how why he is as motivated as he is to get out of San Francisco and if the Eagles can do what he needs to have done. Uh, just a, a memo to our friend Dawn Staley out there. All right, uh, partner, I, I'll be back here tomorrow. Are you in? We got one more. Then it's draft week. Yeah, we'll be right back here in two and two. If you missed any of today's show on the Jacob Media channel, listen to the podcast on your way home. Available on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify.